Um, Good morning. Hello, uh, I'd like to welcome you to the EMC Live webinar, Mill Standard 461, Current Status and Future Considerations. My name is Helen Flood, and I'll be administering this webinar today. I'm the Project Manager at Interference Technology, the host and creator of this event. EMC Live is a new and innovative three-day online event hosted by Interference Technology. This event highlights practical information and topics and will include roundtables, webinars, and videos on everything EMC related. Best of all, there's no cost to attend. Please visit the event website at www.emclive2014.com and planning on joining us for our other sessions over the course of the next two days. This webinar is being presented by Ken Javor. Ken has worked in the EMC industry for 30 years. He is a consultant to government and industry, runs a pre-compliance EMI test facility, and curates the Museum of EMC Antiquities. He is an industry representative to the Tri-Service Working Groups that write Mill Standard 464 and Mill Standard 461. Ken has published numerous papers and is the author of a handbook on EMI requirements and test methods. This webinar is sponsored by our platinum sponsor, Rodian Schwartz, one of the world's largest manufacturers of electronic test and measurement, communications, and broadcasting equipment. EMC and EMI test equipment and systems from Rodian Schwartz determine the causes and effects of electromagnetic interference. For more information, visit www.emc. .rody-schwartz.com. A recording of this webinar and downloadable PDFs will be available on our website next week. Our webinar today will be interactive. We encourage you to ask questions at any time during the session. Take a look at your GoToWebinar navigation pane, the box you see in the corner of your screen. If at any time you have a question, we ask you to use the type box and hit send. To minimize or maximize the navigation pane, click the arrow button. To raise your hand to ask a question or report an issue, click the hand icon. We will present this topic for 35 minutes, followed by a 10-minute question and answer session. At this time, I would like to hand over the webinar to Ken, who will begin the presentation. Um, well, good afternoon. Thank you for attending. Uh, this is Ken Jabor. There's a picture of me in uh, the 2007 EMC Symposium in Honolulu which was the 50th anniversary, and you can see part of that museum that, the, uh, um, that was mentioned uh, in the introduction. And um, a couple things about this uh, is, number one, it, is, it does assume a basic knowledge of the standards, not an overview of the standard. It's basically talking about uh, the changes uh, that have come over time, and a particular emphasis right now because we're looking at the, uh, revising Mill Standard 461F into Mill Standard 461G. That process is ongoing right now, and at least according to schedule, we should have a, a 461G uh, released in 2015. And uh, so, uh, a little bit of background here. So, 1993 marks the beginning of the modern era with the introduction of Mill Standard 461D and 462D, and that's uh, why this thing starts in 1993. We're, we're not going back any further than that. And um, with that, moving on, uh, again, like, in, like it said in the introduction, um, let's see here. So in the introduction, I've been around for a long time, and uh, my, my probably for the purposes of this presentation, my number one uh, uh, qualification is that I am an industry rep to these committees, so I'm pretty well tied into what's going on. Um, the uh, purpose of the standard, as uh, most of you all know, is uh, it controls the EMI characteristics of equipments and subsystems. The general idea is to design and build some level of EMI control into boxes so that all of the work isn't being done at the platform level in integration. That lesson was learned a very long time ago. Um, Mill Standard 461 does function as a contractual requirement, meaning you have to pass the requirements as a, as a contractual requirement. But of course, again, as most of you know, uh, a lot of the times the data is looked at in an engineering sense as to whether or not uh, we can live with it. Uh, the uh, limits are a little fuzzier than, uh, say, RTCA DL-160 or in the commercial world. 
So there's a lot of engineering that goes on after uh, the testing has been done and during the testing has been done. Not all the engineering is done uh, going in. Um, then as a key to the rest of this presentation, uh, black typeface is applicable to all versions. Red typeface was new in revision F, and green typeface is being discussed for revision G. And that's key wording there. I mean, anything we talk about uh, 461G today, it means we've been talking about it. Doesn't mean it's going to be in 461G. There's no, there's not even a draft for industry review review at the present time. And, but um, these are topics that are under discussion. They're of interest to the members of the tri-service tri working group. And the schedule is that we're going to release a draft for industry review this fall uh, and official release of the uh, standard in the first or second quarter of 2015. Well, MIL standard 461 applies to equipments that go in basically any kind of platform that the military might buy. And this slide simply just shows a wide variety of the uh, platforms uh, that, uh, um, that the DOD uh, develops. Uh, applicability of the uh, MIL standard, uh, one of the first things they tell you is that you're supposed to tailor requirements and test methods uh, for, the, uh, for the program at hand. Uh, in my experience, uh, there's relatively little, pro um, little tailoring being done. Okay. So one of the things that's changed over time uh, is the nature of the power source impedance, which affects how we make uh, certain measurements. And so pre-1993, from 1967 to 93, it was a 10 microfarad feed through capacitor, which is a dead short to ground from about 10 kilohertz on up. And, and that, because it is a low impedance, necessitated a current probe type measurement. That is, all of your conductive emission measurements were made with a current probe. And then in 1993, they decided that that wasn't such a great idea for a variety of reasons, and they went to a 50 microhenry LISN, which uh, part of the reason for choosing that was that it had a defined impedance down to 10 kilohertz, which is where they wanted to start CE102. And um, the other, uh, the, at, at the time, it harmonized with a LISN being used in the commercial world. And then uh, there, there are some issues using a high impedance solution like that, especially for high current, uh, like 400 cycle and wild frequency loads. So in 2007, 461F, just as a tailoring suggestion, uh, 5 microhenry Lisbon was uh, added. And, uh, <clears throat> and there's a little bit more to it than that, which we'll talk about. But uh, there is no uh, further discussion of anything like that to date on 461G. Um, another big, well, not a big change, but just uh, an emphasis in 461F said that uh, you cannot uh, shield primary power cables uh, for EMI testing. And that was due to some people who were uh, call, practicing what I call EMC law as opposed to EMC engineering. And, and they were fussing around and, 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 and doing things that weren't technically right. And uh, there was no there was no easy way deemed to deal with that other than just to make a strict prohibition. But the change actually is a change because of the people practicing EMC law. Technically, there was no change. In other words, we're not requiring people to do anything that they weren't required to do under E because the fundamental rule is that you test things as you use them or you test things as you fly them. And in the vast majority of cases, uh, power buses are not shielded. They're certainly not shielded from end to end. Um, and so this was just an emphasis so to avoid people abusing the standard. And then the other thing, the, the other reason I use this picture is, is that the, again, that test as you fly or test as it's used, unless you're actually contemplating covering your test sample uh, with copper foil and copper tape, uh, that's really not uh, an acceptable way to meet the EMI requirements. So. Um, and now, something that has been in the state of flux uh, is there was an original set of requirements, Table 2, which said how fast you could sweep when you're making emission measurements like uh, CE-101, CE-102, RE-102, et cetera. Um, in 461F, there was a recognition that if you've got a low repetition rate broadband type signal, doing those single sweeps as contemplated in Table 2 wasn't always the best way to uh, do the measurement. And so a better way, conceptually now, is to put your spectrum analyzer or EMI receiver looking at a particular band 
on max hold and do multiple fast sweeps until the screen kind of fills up as the intermittent signal you know uh, comes in. And that, of course, it's very hard to write a standard like that. So the numbers uh, that, that in the red column there represent an attempt to make people do, uh, dwell long enough, so to speak, so that when they're doing fast sweeps in max hold mode, they take up the same amount of time as they would have if they'd run a single sweep. But the idea is that the fast sweeps, you're going to capture more intermittence. So that's what the red column is about. Now, a, a change that's, that's occurred since F and something that is being discussed for G is the advent of these time domain EMI receivers where instead of this traditional super het machine looking at one frequency and then stepping to the next frequency and dwelling and stepping and dwelling and so on, we're actually looking at very wide sections of the spectrum. Uh, some of the older machines now are like I think 7 megahertz uh, sections of the spectrum. Some of the newer ones are as much as 40 megahertz. And so you dwell say at seven, you know, in a 7 or 40 megahertz band for the 15 milliseconds and, uh, and you actually capture all that information. And so there's a huge advantage in speed and there's other advantages as well. For instance, if you've got a device that doesn't run very long, like say uh, a hoist that uh, picks up a load and, 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 and moves it for a short period of time, very hard to measure something like that uh, doing an RE-102 sweep, but with a device that looks at large sections of the spectrum at once, very advantageous. Uh, but there is one issue with those that has to be dealt with in 461G, and that's on the following page here. If you've got a low repetition signal uh, that's coming along, say, you know, once a second or, you know, maybe 10 times a second or something like that, you could go for 15 milliseconds and not get anything. And the way that shows up in a, in a <clears throat> traditional sweep is that you're going to have a bunch of frequencies where you don't have anything and then you're going to have a hit. And what the uh, spectrum looks like when you've taken a plot is you're seeing a whole bunch of stuff in there, but it's not everywhere. And of course, we know that the spectrum of a, uh, you know, an impulse is, is everywhere, but we're catching lots of it, but we're catching it intermittently. But with a time domain machine, if we're, if we're sweeping, say, or if we're looking at a 7 megahertz or a 40 megahertz, um, slice of the spectrum for 15 milliseconds, and during that 15 milliseconds we don't have a hit, we're going to have a 7 or 40 megahertz slice where we don't have anything, and that's not so great, right? So one of the things that's going to go in G is some instructions on how to deal with that, and you know, basically they're probably going to have to lengthen the dwell time to account for whatever the rep rate is of intermittent signals that might come out of that box. Now how that's going to be phrased, I can't tell you, but even if you increase the dwell time by a factor of 10 from, say, 15 milliseconds to 150 milliseconds, which gets you down in the range of things that are popping in at only 10 times a second, um, you're still way faster than the, tr than the traditional way of making measurements. So there's going to be some kind of a compromise there uh, to allow the use of these time domain machines and make sure that we don't miss stuff. Okay. Uh, susceptibility sweeps. Um, Prior to 1993, there uh, was no requirement on susceptibility sweeps because the standard of that time was written based on the idea of a human in the loop, a human actually turning a knob and watching some meter for feedback. And, and the, the unspoken assumption was that the human's uh, time constant was so much slower than the test samples that there was no reason to try to control anything. But by 1993, uh, everybody was using synthesized signal sources and programmable and what have you, and so now there was a very real possibility somebody could sweep way faster than a test sample could respond. And so there's controls in there. And the initial controls were probably a little bit conservative, so over time they tried to lighten up. And you can see in the red column that above a gigahertz where the test was painfully slow, as any of you who are actually working in a lab will know, uh, we, we sped things up considerably. Still doesn't mean it's a breeze, but it's a lot better than it used to be. And there has been no further discussion of that in G, so I don't know of anything that might happen there. Okay, so one big change that's been discussed and actually was presented by the Air Force, uh, who owns the spec, um, is that we're wasting an awful lot of time calibrating equipment besides your main standards, like a network analyzer or an EMI receiver spectrum analyzer. Your field monitors that you use for RS-103, all those things have to continue to be calibrated as before. 
the things that are like secondary items, that is things that could be calibrated using your calibrated spectrum analyzer or EMI receiver network analyzer, things like antennas, current probes, lizards and the like, those can all be uh, calibrated in-house and or the point is they can be marked no calibration required. And one of, the, one of the reasons that we can do that in the mill standard world is because we have these measurement system integrity checks where every single test that we do, we verify that everything's working properly before we get started. And um, for those of you who run a lab, you know, I mean, I've seen labs where they buy two of everything just so they'll have one on hand when they when another one goes out of the lab. Uh, so we're trying to uh, de-emphasize that kind of thing. Okay. Oh, and by the way, before I go on, there's an SAE AIR Aerospace Information Report that is being written, or actually is written, uh, to basically say, here's here are some ideas for how to calibrate these things in house, so that every if people want to, they can do that themselves. Okay. And here's a uh, list of the uh, table uh, of all the requirements in the standard. And in red there is CS106, which was new in uh, in, in no standard 461F. And in green at the bottom, not yet added because you know everything's uh, just under discussion, is CS117, which is indirect lightning, which is going to be borrowed. To the extent that it's in there, it's going to be a subset of RTCA DL160 section 22, indirect lightning. And then there's uh, the name isn't even isn't even developed yet, but there's going to be some kind of well some kind of an ESD requirement and test is also under consideration, and it may be borrowed from Section 25 of DO 160. There's also some people talking about uh, 61,000-4-2, uh, probably some mixture of those. All right, and then here's the Table 5 requirements, and I've just uh, added uh, these two tests in case they happen. And what I'm all the whole point here is that everything's in a state of flux. Nobody knows to you know what platforms, what services will want what, but it's a pretty good guess that since RTCA DL 160 is all about commercial aircraft, that the people who would use the indirect lightning effects borrowed from that might be people who have aircraft, which would be Army like helicopters, uh, Navy aircraft, Nav Air, and of course the Air Force, and everybody else is kind of just you know up to them. Uh, this is just a slide showing that if you if you tailor it to from the 50 microhenry lesion to the 5 microhenry lesion, as we discussed earlier, since CE102 is a measurement of RF potential, not current, uh, you have to have a defined source impedance in order to make that measurement. The 5 microhenry lesion does not have a defined source impedance below 150 kilohertz. Therefore, CE101 has to be extended from stopping at 10 kilohertz to stopping at 150 kilohertz. And this limit out of the appendix is a suggestion for how to draw a CE101 limit when you're using a 5 microhenry list. That was just a change in 461F. All right, so a problem that's plagued us for, for, for decades uh, has been uh, when you're doing CS101, audio frequency injection on a power line, on an AC power line, and you're trying to read how much you've injected, and um, you know versus the limit, which is like 6.3 volts RMS uh, below 5 kilohertz. And if you you know if you're doing that, and it looks something like that, and you have to convert that wiggle into you know something compared to the uh, you know the, something that you can compare to the spec. So that's not a fun thing to do, and it's always been an issue. There have been various ways to deal with it. And so there's going to be a change in 461G, or a change is under discussion about uh, another way to do it. Not, not a change, it's an auxiliary way. But there's yet another issue, and this little box is a, is a test aid that we'll talk about in a moment. But the issue on this page is something that's not very well controlled in, in CS101. And that is that when you inject with the coupling transformer, Kirchhoff's law tells you that the injected potential has to drop across either the UT power input or the power source, right? And we only measure what's across the UT. And sometimes you actually end up with a voltage across the uh, power source, and you can't get to the limit, and we're not controlling that. So this little box uh, shows a hookup to both sides. And the point here is I'm just going to show you that sometimes uh, 
you know, the, the switch there is in the EUT position as the voltage across the EUT, and now it's switched over to measuring across the te across the power, uh, and there you see it's a lower amount, but there's still some voltage there, right? Now we're going back to the EUT. So the point is, is that the, that's been proposed that we should be controlling that. Now whether or not that happens, uh, there didn't seem to be a whole lot of interest, uh, but uh, that's an issue with CS101. Okay, now back to this thing of, oops, sorry about that. There we go. Back to looking at uh, injecting, this is 800 hertz ripple on a 400 cycle line, okay? And that's not very pleasant. But if you look on the right hand side, you can see a spectrum analyzer has been used and the highest peak you see there is the 400 cycle line and the next line there, the next peak that has the cursor on it, that's the injected 800 hertz. And if you correct that 70.4 dB microvolts for the 66 dB uh, factor of that test age, you get up to 136 dB microvolts, which is in fact the limit. And so you can see that that is a whole lot easier thing to look at than what we were seeing in the time domain. Um, this device has been deemed handy enough that they're going to add some words or there's discussion that we're going to add some words to 461G so that people are comfortable using this because we live in a world where if it's not specifically allowed, people assume that it's not allowed. And uh, um, so they're going to put something in G to say that, hey, go ahead and use this if you like. And uh, one other thing that this makes available is that in 1993, uh, the, they, there was a piece of test equipment that people used to make this measurement that made it a lot easier. Uh, it's called the phase shift network. They built by solar electronics, and they decided they didn't like that. And you can't use it anymore. And when they got rid of that, what that meant was that you couldn't make any measurements below the power frequency. Because prior to 1993, CS01 was 30 hertz to 50 kilohertz regardless of where there was AC or DC power. But after 1993, uh, it was from the set on AC power is from the second harmonic on out. Well, as you can see on the left there, it's just as easy to make a measurement below the power frequency as above the power frequency. So it gives us that domain back. And just to see what it looks like trying to make a measurement below the power frequency in the time domain, you can see that it looks like an amplitude modulated carrier and it's, you'd have to compare peaks and nulls from one peak to the next peak, and it becomes impossible to do. So the point is, is that with a little device, transferring the measurement to the frequency domain life becomes much easier. And so that's under discussion as well, but there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of interest in, in recapturing that lost spectrum, so to speak. Okay, so on to CS114. This slide here is just a... Uh, this is what CS114 was, was all about, meaning, and I'm not going to go through what these slides mean, but the point is that it's all about electromagnetic field coupling to a wire above a ground plane and the efficiency of that coupling, which is kind of shown there in, in, in the, in the lowest, on, on the bottom trace. And that, that blue curve looks like the CS114 limit, and the black curve is actually what you'd actually measure if you, if you were carefully making the measurements of field wire coupling. So that's where CS114 came from, and the, and the original idea was that we don't do a good job of exposing cables in the shield room at lower frequencies where the cable's electrically short, because we can only expose a few meters of cable length, and in the platform, they may be much longer than that. And under those conditions, RS-103 doesn't work. CS114 picks up the slack there. Okay. But for 461F, there was an addition for Navy ships, uh, surface and submarine, uh, where they added a limit that was just flat from 4 kilohertz to 1 megahertz. That had nothing to do with field-to-wire coupling. It had to do with the fact that they're changing uh, how they're distributed, generating and distributing power on these shifts. And it used to be, you know, it was AC power at a high potential, and then they'd step it down, pretty much like a microcosm of, of, of electric power distribution on, you know, on land. Um, but now they're going to generating a high DC potential and then using DC to DC conversion to step it down for local users. And those high power converters are generating a lot of common mode noise. And so this is a common mode requirement on power lines, basically saying, hey, this is the kind of noise you're going to have on your power lines. You have to be able to live with it. So that was just a piggyback that had nothing to do with the original CS114, just a convenient way to uh, get the requirement in there. All right. And then something that's under discussion for 461G 
is a topic of an article that appeared in this month's uh, In Compliance magazine, the October issue. And what it's about is that um, the way we're doing the test right now under tests low impedance cables, typically cables that are shielded and the shields are tied to ground at both ends. And the change will be such that um, we'll properly uh, apply the current. And the point is that, say, at 10 kilohertz, if you do the test the way that's been suggested in that article, you will, in fact, see about 40 dB more current at 10 kilohertz than you do with the present method right now. And that was a pretty big deal. And you know, I was kind of curious how people would take it. But it turns out there's a lot of concern in the NAV error world in particular that we don't have a ground plane interference test. And the reason we don't have a ground plane interference test that says this in the standard is that you know, we have CS114. And they, it's deemed, it's deemed, uh, it's deemed sufficient. But the NAV air people think that there needs to be ground plane interference because there's a lot more noise at the low end. And so they saw this 40 dB increase of 10 kilohertz and said, hmm, you know, we kind of like that. So, uh, um, so this may be adopted on that basis. But again, there's nothing, nothing to be, uh, nothing, nothing can be predicted at this point other than it is under consideration. So uh, the general idea is that if you think about what CS114 is, you're injecting a potential, right? When you put that clamp around a wire, you're putting a potential in there. And of course, you pre-calibrate the drive level of that thing in the calibration fixture, which has 50 ohms to ground on both ends at low frequency, that's a 100 ohm circuit. And when you then go and you put, put that injection clamp around a low impedance cable, if you just use the drive level, which is, after all, the voltage, and that's what's coupled by an electromagnetic field, then you're going to get that, that voltage could be driving a lot lower impedance uh, circuit, and therefore you get more current. Okay? And, and what's, uh, what's shown here on this slide on the left is the, uh, is the coupling of an electromagnetic field to a circuit, a, a wire that's terminated in 50 ohms on both ends at low frequencies with a, a one meter cable. But on the, on the right is the same exact wire. The only difference is it's been shorted to ground at both ends. And you can see that you know, it's much flatter. And, much, and, and at the low end, you've got a lot more current there. And uh, this isn't anything new or you know, magical or anything like that. The, uh, the picture in the upper right is out of a 1977 uh, publication by A.A. A. Smith. And uh, that is his prediction based purely just on numerical analysis. And uh, you can see that the curve that says Z1 equals Z2 equals 1 ohm, uh, meaning the terminations are 1 ohm, is a uh, much higher level than uh, where he has uh, high impedance at one cable. So that's, that's all been under discussion. All right. And then uh, so moving on to RE102, there's an interesting uh, rod antenna made by Rode and Schwartz that you can see that there in the picture. The rod is much fatter, i.e., the diameter is 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 larger than that of the typical rod antenna, and therefore its capacitance to ground is different than the standard one. And for you know, ever since the beginning of time, we've used 10 picofarads uh, as a uh, you know, kind of a default value for that capacitance. But for this one, it's actually close to 15 peak periods. And Rodian Schwartz pointed this out. And so the, the obvious fix here is to say that, well, 10 peak periods may be nominal, but use the actual value uh, that the manufacturer suggests. And, and so that's a pretty good bet that something like that's going to be in there. So uh, well, let's see here. Uh, other just things that have been under discussion, uh, there's, you know, we want a reverb test. In other words, we have a reverb test for RS-103. There's, you know, we want a reverb test for RE-102, but there hasn't been enough work. So, you know, prediction, we won't see anything about that in G. Um, and then there was a change in F uh, to how we use the rod antenna, which actually looks different. This, this looks more, in this picture, looks more like a pre-F setup. And there have been some practical concerns with, uh, with um, 
461F, that is, it requires a ground on the floor immediately uh, below the uh, counterpoise, and some labs just don't have that. And so we've been casting about for something to do a little differently, uh, but that work hasn't progressed nearly as fast as people have wanted, so there likely won't be anything about that in G either, but it has been under discussion. Okay. RE-103, uh, there was a, uh, let's see, there was a change that said that if you, if you meet RE-102 with the antenna transmitting, obviously not at the antenna transmit frequency, but everywhere else, that's good, and you don't have to do RE-103, and RE-103 is very difficult to do, so that was just made life easier for people. It's particularly useful if you're testing some small device like a Wi-Fi enabled type of thing. Alrighty. RS-103, uh, we bounced around on frequency ranges, particularly nav air under, under uh, F. They only wanted to start at 100 megahertz now. They're actually talking about maybe going all the way down to 2 megahertz. So this is just all under discussion. It pretty much represents different people representing different uh, services at different times. Okay. Let's see here. Um, <clears throat> this is a... Uh, what one of, one of the things that was in F that was put in was a word that says ensure that the E field sensors indicating the field from the fundamental frequency and not from the harmonics. What that's all about primarily is biconicals aren't very good at transmitting fields below 80 megahertz. And in fact, people think they're getting 200 volts per meter, but they're actually not. They're getting it at a second or third harmonic, and that's what the sense of this was. Um, and uh, nothing much is, I mean, that, that stays in there, but uh, nothing much has been done about that. There's, there's no real good solution for making a radiated measurement uh, RS-103 type thing below 80 megahertz with a true antenna. There was various billboards and parallel arms and what have you, but they all have their drawbacks. Um, so let's see here. Um, all right, uh, this is one of the possible solutions, which is to make the biconical arms longer. Uh, and that's great for horizontal. Well, it's not great, but you know it works for horizontal, but uh, it's not too good for vertical because the uh, you got two and a half meters, you got eight feet now end to end, and so the antenna is not positioned properly for actually radiating the test sample. So uh, one, one, one thing that is available though, on the verification, and even if we can't generate a clean signal down there, we now do have methods for uh, monitoring uh, or verifying. In other words, instead of using a broadband field monitor that just gives you a number, uh, we now have devices that will actually show you the spectrum. And so you can actually, if you have the right way to generate the field, you can prove that, yay, verily, that you're, that you're getting 200 volts per meter or whatever your target is at your fundamental and that your harmonics are down low enough that they're not affecting anything. So that those, these are uh, nice uh, pieces of gear to uh, be thinking about. All right, then uh, I'm not going to say anything about all of this complexity except the, the one thing that's been tossed about for CS117, which is the lightning indirect effects. I, I said it would be a subset of DO160 section 22, and the subset meaning that nobody really wants to do pin testing. We don't have pin testing in any other part of the standard. And there are some issues, there's some technical issues for having pin testing in, in lightning and direct effects, but the things under discussion is whether we want to bring that over or just do cable testing. So that's probably the big thing that's under consideration right now with respect to that. And then uh, the ESD test, um, we're not going to be doing anything new. The gun's going to be something that already exists. The, uh, the, the tabletop setup probably be like DO160, and uh, the main issue is how much of DO160 versus 61000-4-2, and um, the other issue with ESD, which has nothing, it's not mill-related, mil but the, what, you know, ESD is always tested in terms of a spec, in terms of a gun potential, but it turns out that in terms of upset, it's usually, as opposed to damage, upsets caused by DIDT, right, the magnetic flux from the ESD event. And it turns out that you get the, uh, you get the most uh, current, the most DIDT at the lower potentials. So when you have something like a 15 kV requirement, that doesn't mean you test a kV and you're done. You have to t test at 2, 4, 6, 8, and 15, or whatever. You have to go through that, in or and you have to pass at all of those, not just the 15 kV. And, 
these slides came from Doug Smith, and uh, on the left is a high potential discharge, in the middle is a medium potential discharge, and the uh, on the right is a low potential like 2 kV. And the reason for that is that the uh, arc is shorter with the lower potentials, and therefore it's a lower impedance, and you actually get more current out of the gun. And so that's uh, that is something that will be factored in to uh, that that will be factored into the test method, whatever test method you know we come up with. So the point is, the important point is, if you have a test lab, if you have an ESD capability right now, you probably have everything you need for the mill standard. If we put this thing in there for G, and likewise, if you have a lightning capability right now you're going to have everything, like indirect lightning, you're going to have everything you need because we're not going to do anything that isn't in DL160. The question is how much of DL160 will get ported into 461G. And I believe we are now done with the presentation and we're open for questions. Ken, thank you so much. Before we open our question and answer session, I am going to call for final questions. So anyone, please feel free to send your last questions, and we'll see how many we can get to. We've had a lot of wonderful questions, um, Ken, and I'm going to start with one while we're calling for the last set of questions. I'm going to start with um, the FCC and CISPR radiated emissions procedures seem technically superior do the rotation and antenna height ranges that are checked. Is there any chance 461 will adopt this in the future? Well, cert certainly not under discussion for G. Um, that, that, that is an excellent question. Um, I disagree with the premise uh, fundamentally, that is, that they're superior. I think they're superior for what they want to do, but we're making near field measurements at one meter. And the reason for that is, is that in a platform, uh, not every platform certainly, but in a platform, you can have an antenna, a victim antenna, within one meter of a test sample. And that's, if, if that's the situation, that's the thing you have to measure. And at one meter, height searches uh, and turntables and all that is probably not the best way to do things. Now, a reverb test might be nice. A re reverb test probably, you know, people would welcome that. Um, but I don't actually see going to three meter measurements because, like I said, there's a variety of platforms where the interaction is much, much closer to three meters. Um, so I'm going to say that that the uh, that the uh, that there are two different worlds, and um, and and there I think the test methods are optimized for each, uh, but I don't think they cross polarize very well. Cross pollinate, excuse me. Okay, um, that's that's my response on that one. Great, Ken. I have a, a quick one here, I think. One of our attendees would like you to go back and reference, what was that report about calibration of secondary equipment using primary equipment such as spec ANDs and network analyzers? Oh, uh, it's, it's not released yet. In fact, uh, it, an, it's an AIR, but the aerospace information report, but I don't know what number has been attached to it, and it certainly hasn't been released, but it is written and once it has been gone through the, the SAE process, uh, it will be released and it will be referenced in MIL standard 461G if that change goes through. In other words, for, it, it'll be in the reference document section of uh, 461G. But there is, I, there probably is a number, but the thing actually has not been through the process, hasn't gone out for vote or anything like that. Okay, let's let's answer this. As I say, Ken, you have a lot of great questions coming in. Has the ESD requirement of 1541A been considered for the ESD requirement? No, uh, no nobody's nobody's even looked at that. Uh, they're they're looking at that. I, I think I have. Let me let me move back up here. Um, let's see here. Uh, all from a gun with 150 picofarads capacitance and 330 ohms resistance. That's a standard gun that people have. The, for those of you who aren't familiar with 1541A, that actually, the implementation of that used the old CSO6 spike generator and a step-up transformer that 
plugged into it, and the output of that, you know, gave you a hellacious voltage. I have that thing; it's fun to use. Um, but the uh, but you just had a set of pins that mounted to the output of the uh, the high voltage transformer. Uh, it probably wasn't the best controlled test in the world, uh, but it'd knock you on your butt if you're not careful. Speaking from personal experience, uh, but uh, anyway, no. The, whatever they come up with will use a standard gun that, that, that EMI test facilities have right now. All right, Ken. What is the recommended way to characterize the EUZ before determining the minimum settings for the receiver in step scan mode or FFT mode? Ah, very good. So the idea, again, that gets back to right now, nobody pays any attention to, you know, what kind of, well, I shouldn't say that. You're supposed to. But in reality, people set up a CE-102 or an RE-102 scan according to Table 2, and they just run with it, right? So with, uh, with, if you're using a time domain machine, um, you don't want to have that situation where you have huge dropouts. So, you, you know, I'm guessing, and this is purely a guess, that we're going to increase the dwell time for a time domain machine, maybe a factor of 10. So instead of dwelling for 15 milliseconds, you dwell 150 milliseconds. That gets you down to about, I said 10 hertz, it's actually technically about 7 hertz. So in other words, if a signal came along at a lower rep rate than 7 hertz, you could miss it. Um, and so if it were me writing it, you know, all by myself, I'd say I'd increase it to 150 millisecond dwell time. And I'd say if you have intermittents that are, that are happening at a lower rate than 7 hertz, then you need to adjust your dwell time accordingly. Um, but how that will actually happen in the standard, uh, I, you know, I can't say. I can't say. I mean, at some point, you've got to say, well, if it's coming along at a slow enough rate, we're just not going to care. Because, you know, if you think about it, if something were coming along at a 1 hertz rate, <clears throat> excuse me, right now, and we have 15 millisecond dwell times, that would be like, 70 frequency, you, you, you would step through about 70 frequencies before you get a hit. So in the 30 megahertz to, uh, to a gigahertz range where we use 100 kilohertz bandwidth, say a 50 kilohertz step size, so if you have 100, if you have 100 frequencies, 50 kilohertz uh, at a step, that'd be, uh, was that, 5 megahertz? So you'd only catch something every 5 megahertz. So, you know, at some point you just got to say, well, you know, we're not going to catch everything. I mean, it's always going to be like that. And the point is to make sure that with the time domain machine that we, we don't lose any more than we might you know, with, with a traditional machine. And we're gaining a whole lot because when you do get a hit, you're going to see it everywhere as opposed to intermittently. intermittently uh, the way I look at it is the, uh, right now the, the way we do things is like using a sieve. You know, most of the stuff, most of the stuff kind of goes through there, but we kept some of it. The, um, the the time domain machine's more like a piece of Swiss cheese. You know, you, it's really solid, but you got some really big holes in it. So we just got to fix things so that you know we tighten down those holes some, and uh, and then we'll actually get better data out of the time domain machine than we do out of a traditional machine if we're careful. Ken, this has been fabulous. We have many, many more open questions. Um, we've received so many of them, more than we can fit in today. So I would just reinforce that we will be sending all questions on to Ken, who will address them, and the content will be posted on the event site so that you can refer back for that information. So please refer back to the event site where we'll post the answers. Also, please feel free to email us at info at emclive2014.com with any additional inquiries, and we'll direct you accordingly. I want to remind all of you that a recording of this webinar will be available on our website, and a link will be sent directly to you. Ken, thank you so much for your time and expertise, and to all of you for attending. Don't forget to check back on the event website for any additional webinars or roundtables you would like to attend in the next two days. Thanks so much. Thank you.